Hi everybody. This is the first of several short units on plant adaptations to shade and how to select plants for shade. By the end of this unit, you'll know how to research plants that are tolerant of shade and you'll understand the basic terminology used in the nursery industry and horticultural trade for describing outdoor plants light exposure tolerances. So let's start with what shade is. The simplest definition of shade is a reduction in light below the normal level. In an outdoor landscape, the source of light is the sun, so anything that prevents any solar radiation from reaching your plants creates a shaded environment and is going to have an effect on plant growth. Let's remind ourselves why plants need light. Plants are autotrophs. This means they're able to manufacture their own food, in contrast to animals, including humans, which are heterotrophs. Plants produce their own food through photosynthesis. They take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from the soil or substrate and convert them to carbohydrates and release oxygen in the process. Light provides the energy source for this process. So no light, no photosynthesis, and no plant survival. That's why plants need light. Outdoors, the light source is solar radiation from the sun. Indoors, in a greenhouse or other crop production structure, solar radiation is supplemented or replaced altogether sometimes by different types of electrical lights, such as high pressure sodium lights or LED lights. How much light do plants actually need? Most land plants that grow in the open in their natural habitat need at least 30% of full daylight to survive. Shade tolerators can survive on around 10% of full daylight. And some herbaceous plants that are native to forest floor ecosystems can grow in just 2% of full daylight. An example of this is some of the herbaceous plants that grow in our local coast redwood forests. Plant growth and survival can be compromised by both a lack of light and an excess of light. So plants have developed physical and physiological adaptations to cope with extremes of light. You've already learned about plants' physical adaptations to intense light in the unit on plant adaptations to heat and drought. Plant adaptations to either intense solar radiation or dense shade are incompatible and no plant is able to perform optimally across the entire light gradient. We can divide plants into two general categories based on their tolerances of light or shade. Plants that perform best at relatively high levels of light intensity can be referred to as heliophytes. Helio comes from the Greek word for sun and phyte means plant, so this term basically means sun lovers or put another way, shade avoiders. Some of these plants may have evolved adaptations to heat. And as I've already mentioned, you learned about these in a separate unit on plant adaptations to heat and drought. A good example of a plant that is a heliophyte is Leucodendron safari sunset. Plants that thrive in shade are called shade lovers or skiophytes, which is derived from the Greek word skio, meaning shade. And a good example of a skiophyte or a shade lover is Fatsio japonica, the Japanese Aurelia. In both these groups, the sun lovers and the shade lovers, there are obligate and facultative plants. Obligate shade lovers and obligate sun lovers absolutely have to be grown in either shade or sun respectively in order to survive. Facultative sun lovers are able to tolerate some level of shade and facultative shade lovers are able to tolerate some direct sun. They may not necessarily perform at their optimum though. In an ornamental landscape though, we may not be too concerned with whether or not a plant is performing at its physiological optimum. Our main concern is the aesthetic quality of the landscape. If we're growing fruit or veggies though, then the productivity of these plants will be influenced by light and therefore, if we're growing these crops, we need to pay closer attention to light and shade. And I'll come back to this in a separate unit in this module. 
So what creates shade in a landscape? Think of a landscape you're familiar with. Maybe the landscape you've chosen for your planting scheme project. And think about how the sun falls on this site. Perhaps you already have a plan for your planting scheme project that looks something like this one here. Or perhaps the plans is just still in your head. Either way, ask yourself, are there any shaded areas? And where are those shaded areas in the landscape? Think about where east is, where the sun rises, and where west is, where the sun sets. How does the sunlight falling on your landscape change throughout the day? Let's work through this example here on the slide. The landscape in this diagram is actually the front garden of a friend of mine who lives just a mile away from Cabrillo in a residential neighborhood in Soquel. The house is a single story with a garage, neighbors on both sides here and here. And the front yard's about 35 feet deep and 70 feet wide. There are three planting areas, one here, one here, and one here to the right of the driveway. The sun rises in the east over here and shines on the garden for most of the day. There are shaded areas though. There are some shaded areas in the middle right here and some shaded areas especially here in this back corner and along this side. So let's write shade in there and shade in the middle. In your own landscape, now that you've identified any areas of shade, think about what's creating the shade. Is it a structure like a wall or a fence or a building, or is it other plants? If it's plants, what type of plants are they? And have they reached their mature height and spread yet? If they're still growing, how are the shaded areas likely to change as the plants get bigger? Going back to this diagram here, shade is created over a relatively large area of this front garden by an evergreen pear tree that's planted right here. The small black circle represents the trunk of the tree and the larger circle rep represents the spread of the tree canopy. There's also a shaded area on the west side of the garden created by a tall, dense hedge that's about eight feet tall. Now, let's think about how the shade in those shaded areas changes throughout the day. Are they shaded all day, most of the day, or just for a couple of hours? Perhaps you have an area that's shaded seasonally rather than on a daily basis. You might have an area that's sunny during the long days of summer when the sun's high in the sky and is then shaded for much of the day in the winter when the angle of the sun's much lower. Going back to the diagram here, the planter bed on the right is in a full sun all day. So this planter bed right here. But the planter bed on the left is shaded from around 2 p.m. in the afternoon especially in this back corner there, much closer to the house. This planter bed in the middle is in dappled shade all day. So still thinking about your landscape, are there any areas that aren't shaded, but where you'd maybe like there to be some shade? For example, perhaps you'd like to have an outdoor seating area that's shaded in summer, so you can hang out outside in the hot summer sun and not fry. Evaluating sun and shade and noting factors that may cause daily or seasonal changes in them are important components of site evaluation as they help you select plants that will thrive in those areas. I mentioned in the previous slide that the level of shade isn't constant. It changes throughout the day and throughout the year, depending on the season and the sun's angle in the sky. The amount of shade can also change according to what's creating the shade. For example, under deciduous trees, the amount of shade can change as the trees lose their leaves and then leaf out again a few months later. 
The same thing can happen with an outdoor area that's covered with a deciduous vine. The size of the area that's shaded can depend on the height of the structure or landscape element that's creating the shade. If the structure is a building or a wall or a fence, then the height will be constant. But if there's a living landscape element, such as a hedge, as in this picture on the right here, or a young tree, then the amount of shade is going to increase as these plants grow, unless you're going to prune them to keep them to a specific height. And you need to take this growth into consideration when you're selecting plants for the landscape. Part of creating a successful cultivated landscape, whether it's with ornamental or edible or both types of plants, depends on your ability to identify the sunny and shaded areas during a site evaluation, and then on your ability to select plants that are, appro that are appropriate for the different light exposures. In California, where water resources are scarce and unpredictable, the success of a sustainable landscape will also depend on your ability to choose plants that are both tolerant of the light exposures at the planting site and are water wise. So how do you select plants for shade? Or more accurately, how do you select plants for a lack of light? Well, experience counts for a lot, but that's not very helpful if you're just starting out. Or perhaps you are experienced and you're just wanting to expand your plant palette. If you don't have much experience or perhaps just need some inspiration, you can go on a plant walk in different local neighborhoods or visit public or botanical gardens and make a note of what's working and not working in other people's landscapes. You can go to a retail nursery and look at plants in the shade areas and read the labels or descriptive signs. Be careful here though, sometimes there may be sun loving plants in the shade areas because the nursery didn't have enough space in the sunny areas or because they don't have to water plants as much or as frequently when they're in the shade. Displaying containerized plants in the shade also keeps the roots much cooler in their plastic containers, which helps prevent root rot. So don't assume that all plants in the shade area in a retail nursery are always going to be shade lovers. If you're a landscape professional, you can go to a wholesale nursery. Again, don't always assume that all plants in the shade areas are shade lovers. Sometimes wholesale nurseries put young or newly transplanted plants in the shade area, especially in the summer, because they tend to be vulnerable to heat stress, and this can be prevented by putting them in the protection of a shade house. You can also go online and use a searchable database. Many nurseries now have searchable databases on their websites that allow you to enter specific search parameters. San Marcos Growers, Suncrest Nurseries and Del Mountain Wholesale Nursery all have searchable databases on their websites. If you're working with California natives, then Calscape is a good resource and has a searchable database. You can also sign up for Plantmaster, which gives you access to other useful professional tools as well. If you're a landscape professional or wanting to become one, it's worth creating your own database of plants that work in particular situations, including different levels of shade, so that you can quickly and efficiently select plants for a project and not waste time doing lots of research. Doing the research is usually lots of fun and you can learn a lot, but it's not always time that you're paid for, so it's not always an efficient or economic use of your time. If you're going to do some research, you need to understand the basic commonly used terminology you'll come across in books, on websites, and in the nursery trade. When we're growing crops of plants commercially in a greenhouse or other structure, it's really important to be able to measure the quality, quantity, and duration of light reaching the crop, and understand the effects of manipulating these at different stages of plant growth. Outdoors in a landscape, we don't have to be as precise and we have limited ability for, manip for manipulating the quality, quantity and duration of light. Therefore, the terminology is very basic and very generalized. Exposure tolerances that you'll see include full sun, morning sun, 
light shade or perhaps dappled shade or filtered shade and dense shade. So what do these all mean? Full sun is generally understood to be at least six hours of direct sun or direct light per day. Morning sun means direct sun up until around noonish and afternoon sun is direct sun from around noon until dusk. Morning sun is less stressful for plants than afternoon sun because by the afternoon heat has begun to build up and plants may be beginning to suffer some drought stress. This is particularly true away from the coast in California in hotter inland areas that aren't affected by the coastal fog that often ro rolls in in the afternoon in the summer on the coast, which helps to reduce the heat and drought stress on plants. Dappled shade means that there are usually small pockets of sunlight, sunflecks, making their way through a tree or shrub canopy. And you can see this illustrated in the photo on the right here, where you can see areas of shade there on the, the grass and then areas of bright sunlight where the sun is making its way through the tree canopy. Filtered shade or light shade are very similar and describe situations where the sunlight is filtered by the canopy of a tree or other overhanging plants. Light levels in these areas are probably between 40 to 80 percent of full sun levels. Dense shade means there's no direct sunlight hitting the ground and that most of the incoming solar radiation is intercepted by a very thick tree or shrub canopy or by a structure. Think of being in the middle of a coast redwood forest where the tree canopy is completely closed. That's dense shade. Light levels here can be as little as 2% of ambient levels, which greatly restricts your plant choices in this kind of shade. So that's what the basic terminology means. Take a break now and then continue with the next unit to learn about how sun-loving plants can adapt when they're planted in shade.